This is a production of WEDU PBS, Tampa, St. Petersburg, Sarasota. Coming up next, the number of COVID-19 cases rises again sharply in Florida. The governor says he'll stay the course on continuing to reopen the state. The new state unemployment numbers are out and charges against peaceful protesters were dropped this week but were filed against other people who allegedly committed property crimes during the first nights of unrest in Tampa following George Floyd's killing. All this and more next on a special edition of Florida This Week. Welcome back. It's good to be back in the WEDU studios, but we're still not back to normal, and it looks like normal is a long way off. Florida's confirmed coronavirus cases continued to climb this week, setting records day after day. 3,200 new infections were recorded alone on Thursday. Since June 1st, the number of new cases in Florida has been steadily rising. The increases have come as the state's economy reopens from the partial shutdown that began in March when the pandemic spread across the nation. This week, Governor DeSantis downplayed the seriousness of the growing outbreak, saying it was due more to testing and to confined pockets among farm workers, long-term care facilities, and jails. And he says he'll continue the process of reopening. But in terms of like, you know, the restaurants have been doing this for, what have they been doing it for, for six weeks? I mean, the idea that that all of a sudden is the reason, I'm not sure that that's, um, that that's the case. So no, we're not shutting down. Officials say that in parts of Florida, people under the age of 35 are testing positive for the coronavirus at a higher rate since the pandemic began. The surge in cases brought a call from some doctors that masks should be required in public. The mayor of St. Petersburg is requiring that all employees of businesses wear masks in areas accessible by the public. We have a choice, St. Pete. We can suffer the short-term inconveniences and put the worst of this virus behind us, or we can suffer indefinitely in fits and starts. We can wear a mask, protect others and ourselves, or we can contribute to someone's death, maybe even our own. Tampa's mayor followed suit, imposing a mask-wearing requirement in all indoor locations. And this Monday, Hillsborough County officials will debate whether or not to have a similar mask ordinance countywide. We're joined now by Dr. Jason Wilson. Uh, Jason is the Associate Director of the Adult Emergency Department at Tampa General Hospital. Tampa General has taken a number of proactive steps in dealing with the COVID-19 virus. And Dr. Jason Wilson, welcome back. Good to see you. It's good to see you. We're back in the studio now, Rob. Yep, six feet apart. Uh, let me put up the uh, graphic of the famous uh, Florida Department of Health sure. uh, uh, COVID-19 dashboard. Uh, sure. And when we, when we look at this, what's the, What's the number that you focus in on when you look at that dashboard? Sure, there's, there's, there's a few things I look at. You know, one of the things when you follow this every day, you want to get a sense of where are we heading and where have we been. And one of the nice things about the dashboard is it does tell us that information. It tells us uh, over time what's happened. And uh, to be able to simply look at kind of a bar graph appearance and sort of get a sense of what does that pattern look like. Um, in technical terms, what we're trying to figure out is are we in a linear growth or are we in exponential growth? So what we want to make sure we don't see is doubling or even higher numbers of that bar graph going up every day. Unfortunately, the thing that started to concern us about a week and a half or two ago was that it really seemed like we had flipped from kind of a linear growth, um, which is just kind of a predicted number of cases at a constant rate added every day, which, by the way, we never really came out of that. Even when we were uh, starting to do much better, we still were plateaued a linear growth phase. And uh, um, we, could, we could stay uh, kind of contain that. Uh, we were able to keep capacity in the hospitals to contain that. Uh, we could coexist with that safely. But if we get into an exponential growth phase, then we start to get worried because the number of positives each day goes up rapidly. The other thing that's really important to look at as well is uh, not just the number of tests that we're doing, but also what what's the prevalence of those tests that are positive? What per 
percent of people have a positive test. Um, and this gets into the question, are we just seeing more positive patients because we're testing more people? Or is there something different going on in the pattern of the type of COVID that's out there? And I think what we know now is that if we go back in time into mid-May, late May, into early June, we saw the prevalence drop as low as 2.5 percent, even when we were testing a lot of people. Mm. And then as that testing volume started to increase, what we would expect the prevalence was going down. If the actual amount of COVID that out, was out there was actually low, we'd expect that prevalence to either stay flat or to start to drop. But instead, what we've actually seen is that prevalence has started to rise. And so for four to five consecutive data points, we've seen that prevalence go up and up and up and up. And I think what we're starting to see now is the even the direction of how it goes up is starting to shift. So this graph, the, the yellow bars in the upper right, yes. uh, that's the number of cases per day. That is rising dramatically. 3,800 new cases on Friday. Right. Should we be really concerned that it is roaring back? This is the most concerning time of the virus in general. And I would actually say... Uh, roaring back versus is just roaring what we expected and so you know are we in a first wave or a second wave i would kind of call this if you look at that yellow graph again you know it's sort of a um a wave that's coming up this way so you've got some you know little blips and starts and stops here but overall the pattern has been sort of up and now we're kind of on that steep part of the slope but if you look at our slope at how fast cases are rising it actually looks as bad as dade county did when they got into some trouble and even at times as bad as new york did when they got into some trouble mm -hmm. uh the mayors of tampa and st petersburg have uh, put out ordinances requiring masks be worn in public uh also the county com uh the counties pinellas county and, and hillsborough county are probably going to move in that direction too let's show this uh, uh slide of, sure. of masks do masks help how much do they help okay so i think uh the public has gotten some confusing information about masks and i think it's important to talk about masks a little bit you know if you go back uh to january february march you've seen conflicting statements about masks one of the things that happens during a global pandemic when essentially every person on earth is impacted by it somehow and every population does something a little bit different is we get a lot of information very quickly so we've been actually been able to collect a lot of data about whether mask wearing helps or not uh, a couple of important papers have come out one in science which is a very uh, the, the prominent science journal and then one in lancet which is the prominent medical journal both those papers looked at different populations throughout the world and looked at places where mask wearing was uh, required as people started to roll back social distancing measures and places where they didn't. And in all the places where mask wearing was required, they really kept things under control. We know a lot more about the virus now than we did last time you and I talked. So we know things like how much does the viral particle spread when you cough? What size maybe the viral particles? Uh, how big is it? Is it a micron? Is it 10 microns? How big is it? Could I have any protection from wearing a mask? The data is clear now that if we're within six feet of each other and we're going to be within six feet of each other of a period of time over a few minutes and we're indoors, we have a pretty high risk of spread. If I wear a mask, the whole point of me wearing a mask, I can keep myself from giving you the virus by cough or sneeze. Now, on the graph, you can see that that does decrease transmission some if one of us are wearing a mask. But the other part of this is that if we both wear a mask, we can really bring that transmission rate way, way down. And we have to think of it like a tool like anything else. Social distancing is a tool. Hand washing is a tool. Mask wearing is a tool. Um, if we're not going to social distance, we have to really start to emphasize the other pieces of our tool set, which is hand washing and mask wearing. Mm -hmm. uh, you and I talked the other day, and you talked about the rise of asymptomatic cases. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing that's going on is that the, the governor said on Friday, younger and younger people are getting this. If, if we have 30 seconds, if you're young, do you feel like you're invincible to this? I mean, should you feel like you can go still go to the bars and go out in public and this and in it's, it's a great question. There's, there's two. This, this, this ties the story of masks, first of all. So this is why we need masks so badly right now, because we have young people who are pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic who are really the ones right now we're seeing spread this virus. Now, the problem with that is that it's, it is true that most young people who get the virus probably will not do as as poorly as people who are older or who have comorbidities. But that doesn't mean that all young people are going to do fine. We have seen some very sick young people with no comorbidities at all. The other part of this, the way I think about this, is that about 20% of people who get the virus are going to get very sick. So that means the no more... No matter what age. No matter what age, yeah. So um, the, the more young people who have this, 
the more that 20% number starts to grow and grow and grow, and we see more and more sick people. So if we have lots and lots of young people with virus, we have 20% of those people overall, they're going to get very, very sick, and that's when we start to get worried about our hospital capacity and utilization. We're okay there right now. Your hospitals are still safe, and we're still doing okay. We're sharing data and talking about this, but that's the worry we have is that pre-symptomatic spread. Jason Wilson, thanks a lot. Doctor. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you, Rob. Thank uh, you. So our next guest is Yvette Lewis. She is the president of the Tampa NAACP. And Yvette, thank you for coming on Florida this week. Great to see you. Great to see you, and thank you for this invitation. I want to ask you about masks. Uh, do you have some fear? Uh, tell me about what your concerns are about uh, uh, the, this requirement now in the city of Tampa and elsewhere that uh, people are going to have to wear masks when they go into the stores. And Well, one of the things is, um, you know, the medical part of me understand the need to wear a mask, but then when it comes to um, the society accepting masks in, in stores, uh, it's really difficult because one of the things is we get a lot of calls about African American males going into stores, and the people are calling the police on them. So we have a we got an influx of calls coming into our office. So I'm a little conflicted about the mask. So um, my thing is, if you're going to tell the people to wear the mask, which I understand, then you need to educate society. You need to educate all the people that black males are going to walk into your store with a mask on. And they don't have hostile intent. And they don't have hostile intent. Yeah. They just want to purchase something. Uh, tell me about what kind of reforms you think uh, the Tampa Police Department needs beyond what's been done in Tampa already. One of the f reforms, they need to do a more in-depth training. Um, you know, uh, they need to train the officers, one, that we were hearing from other officers, how to report another officer that is doing wrong. They need to know how to report that, and then when they report it, there's no repercussions. There's no retaliation, and there's no fear for breaking that code of blue. Mm -hmm. so, uh, the city of Tampa has a police review commission. Is it effective? You mean the Citizen Review Citizen Board? Review Commission, yeah. No, it's not effective at all. There is, um, they only review cases that are closed. So what's the point of reviewing something that's already closed? It's already done. So it's, it's mute. Mm -hmm. So what would you like to see done to, to be, more, be more proactive and active as the case is still alive? As the case is still alive. Yeah. And it needs to have uh, more teeth. It needs to have, citizen, uh, it needs to have subpoena power. And it needs to have an um, a fair assessment of the community that sits on that board. And the board needs to be transparency. The best thing to happen for that board, um, it needs to be removed from up under the mayor and placed upon the city council. So let the city council uh, people um, make the appointments as opposed to the mayor putting on there. The people the current who are currently on that board now, they were placed there by the, most of them were placed there by the previous administration. So the board is kind of padded, very kind of heavyweight on one side than the other. So um, the board is ineffective. If you Google it and go to the city's website, you don't even know who the board is, who sits on that board. So um, it, it really needs to be revamped and redone over. There are calls around the country to either disband police departments or defund uh, some aspects of police departments. Where does the Tampa NAACP stand on that issue? Well, I'm not going to tell you to disband the police department because when I get in trouble, I have to call them. You know, there's a fear when I call them, but I have to call them. And so we want them to remain us safe, but it can be done properly. So dismantling or uh, defunding is not the purpose proper or the right thing to do. The right thing to do is to ensure that the citizens and that the African Americans in the city of Tampa have trust back into the police department because there's a lack of trust between both the police department and the African American community, the African American community and the police department. Uh, the, uh, how do you think the Tampa Police Department has treated the people that have been marching and protesting uh, in the days since George Floyd was killed? Wow. Um, you know, the I was very, um, I, I, I was at a couple of protests just watching it. And one of the protests that I was at was, was on MLK. 
and 22nd Street. And as I watched, I see people, I see the police march up in riot gear and full riot gear. And I have never seen that before. So um, in the streets of Tampa, it was scary. You know, it reminded me back of the movies that I had watched uh, back on Selma when people were trying to fight for the voting rights, when people were marching on Washington. And um, and I said, oh, my God, what what's next? They're going to put the water hose on the people. Are they going to release the dogs on the people? It was really scary to see, um, you know, my people, black people, run for their dear lives and to see the police march up there like that. Yvette Lewis, thank you for coming on Florida this week. Well, thank you so much for asking me. Happy Juneteenth. Yes. Thank you. Florida's unemployment rate jumped higher in May, hitting a record 14.5%, up from 13.8% the month before. Before the coronavirus hit and devastated the state's tourism, retail, and other industries, February's unemployment rate had just been 2.8 percent. The state's unemployment rate is at levels not seen since the Great Depression of the 1930s. This comes as many Florida workers who've lost their jobs either have been turned down for unemployment benefits or could not navigate the system. Joining us now is a Clearwater labor attorney, Ryan Barrick. He serves on the executive committee for the Florida Bars Labor and Employment Section. Ryan Barrick, thank you for coming on Florida this week. Great to see you. Good to see you. Thank you for having me on. So, Ryan, I know that uh, we've talked before uh, in the past. We've talked about uh, clients coming to you, having problems. Do you think the problem is fixed with the state system? Absolutely not. The problem continues. In fact, uh, this week, The union that represents the Disney workers uh, said that they had done a survey of their employee, their workers, and approximately 30 percent of them had not received their benefits, despite the fact that they were supposed to be automatically enrolled in the system. We've had over 460,000 people who thought they were entitled to benefits and applied for benefits who weren't eligible, according to the state. It's a mess. Why do you think the state hasn't been able to fix it? What's the problem in Tallahassee? Well, the problem is the system was designed to fail. When it was put into place, it was specifically designed to control the outflow of benefits. That's the language that the Rick Scott administration used. They wanted to control the outflow of benefits. They wanted to make it difficult for people to get benefits, and they wanted the benefits to be very low. And they succeeded with both of those things. If the numbers are in the hundreds of thousands, then these people have to be at the point of crisis for their household finances. Absolutely. There, there's a real, there's a, a situation where you have a lot of people who haven't gotten the benefits they thought they were going to get, and they don't have those backup systems that they would normally have. They can't call their family members or their friends or necessarily even go to their churches or synagogues like they used to be able to because those people and those systems are also being taxed by the very high levels of unemployment and by the pandemic. It's a real problem. Uh, The the people that I've talked with who have been denied say just filing for unemployment is hard, that the the whole website needs to be redesigned. And one of the things they need to take into account is the changing nature of the job uh, system uh, that most of us are in. There's a lot of part-time work, there's a lot of private contracting, and the state didn't anticipate that when it set up the system a few years ago. Well, and that's right. And it, it not only did they not anticipate it, they haven't adjusted the benefit amount in 22 years. So Florida's state maximum benefit is $275, which hasn't been adjusted in a very long time, 22 years. So you have a low benefit amount, a difficult-to-navigate system, a system that doesn't recognize gig workers or employees who have a variety of jobs. It, it really, it, it's a problem for so many people right now. The governor said the other day that it's about 97% fixed, that that if you deserve benefits, about 97% of the people who deserve benefits have, have gotten benefits. I, I, I think that is not at all what we're hearing. That's not what the state's actual data shows. I mean, if you if you slice and slice and slice and slice, you can say, well, yes, look, we're looking at this very small part. But where you have 460,000 Floridians 
who thought they were entitled to benefits, who went through the process of applying for benefits and were rejected, that says to me that there's something wrong with the system where you have that many Floridians who thought they should be getting benefits who aren't. On top of the state system, there's this federal aid that if you're unemployed, you're supposed to be able to get an additional $600. Uh, do, do the problems with the state system create a problem for those people that are also trying to get federal money? Absolutely, because it's utilizing the same software. It's going through that same system. So the problems that you have with the state benefits are just as the same thing with the federal benefits. It's not like there's a separate federal system. Also, to be eligible for some of the federal benefits, you have to be eligible for the state benefits. So if somebody earns 274, they can get the additional $600 of federal benefits, but if they earn 276, they don't. So that, that $1 spread there, that $2 spread there, can have a significant impact on the amount of benefits somebody's receiving, somebody who's being brought back to work on sort of a part-time or easing back into the workforce. It can have a huge impact on them. What are the possible solutions? What ideas have you heard? I know that there was a lawsuit that was filed in Tallahassee. What, what are the possible solutions? Well, really what, what needs to happen is the legislature needs to go into a special session to fix some of these issues. We're going to have a problem very soon because the federal additional benefits run out at the end of July. July 31st, that additional $600 runs out. And under current law, people are only entitled, under current Florida law, people are only entitled to 12 weeks of benefits. And many people are going to run out of their 12 weeks of benefits very soon. Um, and while there's a formula at which it goes, it, the number of weeks can go up, it doesn't actually take effect until October. So there's going to be a big hole there between people who, who lost their jobs early in the pandemic and haven't been able to be hired back until we end up uh, in October. So really, the legislature needs to go back into special session and fix these issues. Uh, we shouldn't be relying on the governor issuing these executive orders all the time. It's really something the Florida legislature should fix, should increase the benefits amounts, should increase the number of weeks of benefits, should increase eligibility, should recognize the realities of the modern economy and that people work gig jobs and that people work uh, part-time positions and address all of those with a comprehensive fix. If you're turned down for unemployment in the state of Florida, you're allowed to appeal. How hard, how difficult is that appeal process for Floridians? Well, in a normal time, it takes a couple weeks, usually a two or two, uh, excuse me, about two months to have your appeal hearing, and it's a telephone hearing. But right now, we're not even getting notice about when they're having those hearings. So we filed appeals, and they're just sitting there. We don't know when the state is going to hear those. They don't have enough appeals referees to hear all of the appeals because, again, there's volume coming into the system. So those people who have been denied and are pending, who have been denied, aren't in a position where they're going to have a hearing anytime soon. Uh, and it's not an easy-to-navigate system. Those hearings are designed to be like mini-trials over the telephone. Uh, there's, there's rules. There's witnesses. It's not an easy process, and the state – again, has denied so many people, and now we're going to end up with people going through that process, which can be difficult to navigate. Ryan, your practice is in Clearwater. Uh, we just have 30 seconds left. How many people are you hearing from? I mean, are, is the, are you getting an avalanche? What, tell me the, the number of calls you're getting on this issue. Well, I'll be honest with you, Rob. Things are beginning to, to taper down because people have become so frustrated with it. There's just a, a sense of, you know, that it's a hopeless battle which I think is part, again, is part of what was originally designed to the system. They wanted to make it so hard that people would give up, and that's happening. And we urge people to keep filing, to keep going in and claiming your weeks. If you're denied appeal, to keep pushing because you're entitled to those benefits and you should get those benefits. Brian Barrick, thanks for coming on Florida this week. Great to see you. Great to see you, too. Have a good week. Stay, stay safe. Happy Father's Day. Thanks. <laughs> Before we go, we'll leave you with some more inspiring music this week. This time, a global collaboration featuring Tampa's own Gumby Ortiz, who's a world-class percussionist. Stay safe. We'll see you next week. Happy Father's Day.
Florida This Week is a production of WEDU, who is solely responsible for its content.